welcome you for coming today. We have a full agenda, so we need to get started. It's not on. It's not on. It's not on. It is. It's on. So uh, the first thing we like to do after we welcome is this program today is dedicated to Alan Muddle, who was an active member in the Interlake and the Stowe Society. He was a spark plug for our plowing days. Uh, he loves kids. Uh, and so, Ann, come on up. <laughs> My son Eric is going to read uh, what you wrote about Alan. Am I supposed to die? You die right into both feet. All right. Yeah, thanks for coming up here too, Ann. So yeah, I'm gonna read what Ann wrote on behalf of Alan in her time. So the uh, dedication, if you had a program, is in here too. So Alan was born in Otesco County near Cooperstown, New York. He grew up on a dairy farm in the era of beautiful draft horses. He loved farming and horses both. When told by the high school guidance counselor that he should go into farming, Alan instead chose civil engineering, but his love of farming remained. In 1969, Alan and Ann purchased an old house in about 100 acres, which he reluctantly invited others to farm. He became a house renovator and builder, all of this in his spare time after a full day's work as an engineer. The house came with about six acres of cherries. The whole family was involved in the U-Pick operation. The girls became tired year after year as customers patted their heads and remarked how they had grown. But Alan was determined to farm, even on a small scale. He began to get the barn ready for a cow. Our neighbor, Charlie Batty, had a, cow, ca had a calf for sale. Alan paid for the calf, but had to delay bringing it home until the barn was ready. Finally, he brought the calf home. Unfortunately, the calf thought his home was Charlie Batty's and kept going back. It's a wonder that the road between our houses was not worn out by the comings and goings of our calf. This was an inauspicious start to Alan's farming. The cherry trees were pretty exhausted at this point, and Alan switched from cherry farming to a certified organic beef business. He had about 20 cows and was able to farm his own land. And to add to the mix came Luke and Lady, a pair of five-year-old Belgian draft horses. The aim, of course, was for him to farm with horses. He thought Luke and Lady knew how to plow. They thought he knew how to plow with horses. Apparently, no one did. So they were very picturesque, and we had lots of lovely carriage rides. Alan knew all the farmers and appreciated all the knowledge and hard work they represented. He knew everyone and was friends with everyone. He worked for years at the Interlaken Historical Society, mixing his love of farming and history. They were good years. There were lots of fine ideas which culminated in the covert tour, barn tours, and even plowing day. His love of farming piqued, piqued his interest in all of the farms that had been abandoned on the national forest lands, and he became the spark plug for the Backbone Ridge History Group. He loved civil engineering, but it was nothing compared to Alan's love of good earth and the men and women who work it. So yes, thank you, Ann. Oh, and I have, uh, I have a plaque, plaque for you. This is an appreciation for, for Alan and all he's done for the community and for the historical societies. So thank you. Thank you. I want to sit down before I start. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you. Now our featured speaker today is Pam Rays. She is, she can introduce herself, but she does not run out of things to talk about. <laughs> I think I'm just going to here. Let's see, folks. Well, welcome, everyone. As John said, my name is Pam Rays. Um, I work at the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station. We were recently rebranded as Cornell Agritech in the past two years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences and how they relate to great research and what I'm currently doing now as someone who works there. Um, and hopefully, I will do that. I'll watch my time. I don't want you all to be bored and fall asleep. So briefly, really quick, um, I will talk. Sorry, I find this is very awkward. 
All right, makes me feel like a bit of a diva. Um, so I always like to say a little bit of the history of the egg station, which could go on forever. I'll try to do it in like 30 seconds. So basically, in the 1870s, there were a lot of farm groups, um, New York State Grange, um, different entities, and they were all uh, very interested in getting an egg station, as they called it, um, here in New York State. So they approached the New York State Legislature, and in 1880, there was a law enacted for the establishment of, as they called it, the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station. Now, in 1982 is when they first started opening, when they opened and started research, um, was very small. Um, the director was E. Lewis Sturdivant, and his goal was not the same as what the local farmers. Local farmers, first they thought the whole idea was just a waste of state's money, you know, why are they throwing money into this egg station? Um, they also thought it would become a model farm, and they thought, well, you would go to this egg station, and you would see how they were plowing and what they were doing, and that's how you would help improve your farming. Um, sort of it had the foresight to see that um, applied research is great, but there needs to be more stuff done in the lab before you actually take it out into the field. And that's been kind of the history and the focus of the way things have been done at the egg station ever since. Um, so, enough of that history. Um, moving on to myself, so 1990, I took my first job at the station, and I did actually work with grapes. Um, I would spend hours a day assessing grape vines, literally turning over leaves. Um, there were ways of assessing, basically, um, if 10% of the leaf um, was affected by whatever disease we were monitoring, um, it would be a one, and so on, up to a 50% of the leaf was um, covered with whatever we were looking for, whether it was Famopsis, powdery, or downy mildew, um, it would be considered a five, which was the worst. And so just imagine all these grape leaves, all these different plots, and all this data was assembled to help see if the trials were working. And that particular project was what they called a low input sustained agriculture project. So basically, they were trying to find ways to grow grapes that required less pesticides and also less work. Um, I didn't work on that project long, and then I found myself actually working in the um, vinification and brewing lab. So that's where all the fun begins. Um, the vinification and the brewing lab, as it sounds, vinification is the art of you know, making wine, taking the grapes and turning them into wine. Um, I worked there for about seven years with the head winemaker, Luann Preston Wilsey, and that's kind of where I pick up the talk about uh, the research we did. Um, if you think about a grape, a grape is a fruit like many other fruits. Um, you take a peach, you make a cobbler, it's wonderful, right? But it still kind of tastes like a peach cobbler. But if you take a grape and you ferment it, it can taste like many different things. You know, if you're really into tasting wine, the sensory, and of course, that's what we're selling here in New York State, right? Is that experience, the sensory. There's so much that goes into it. So you start out with, you have to have good vines, right? You have to start somewhere. And then there's the whole winemaking process that has to be done the right way. And then finally, sensory. And so much of the research that we did in the wine lab was focused on those two areas, the viticulture and enology. Um, some of the viticulture trials, um, I didn't really know as much about. Um, sometimes it was a spray trial um, where they were spraying different things and they wanted to see if the sprays, um, you know, based on the health conditions of the vines and the fruit that was coming in were affected um, long term. So you'd make the wine, um, wine making, simple as it is. Um, you come in with the grapes, we would destem them and they would be either pressed or they would be done on the skins if they were red and then you'd make the wine. Uh, the wine would be stored for a certain amount of time and we would actually have sensory analysis done. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about sensory analysis. But it is kind of interesting to talk about some of the beginnings of the great breeding program. And um, let me refer to my notes um, because it is quite extensive. Um, very early on, so the station started in um, 1882. By the 1880, late 1880s, um, they were starting to dabble in a lot of pomology, and that's kind of where some of the um, viticulture started, was with the roots of the pomology. They kind of, some of the professors kind of did both back then. Um, but they were working on a lot of table grapes. Table grapes were the big thing. Um, you have to realize that our native grapes were not considered, you know, good enough for making fine wines, right? Um, our native grapes have a character that they call foxy. It has nothing to do with the way a fox smells. Uh, but if you think of cotton candy or Jolly Ranchers, that's what that foxy characteristic is. And of course, that was not considered, you know, appropriate for fine wine. So, um, again, as I say, early on, the focus was on making seedless table grapes. Um, we worked with um, the New York... Um, well, of course it escapes me, right? That we all have this happen. Anyways, the Horticulture Society down in New York City, down in the Bronx, and we actually did release 
a seedless grape that was called the Bronx grape. How original, right? Um, by 1925, more seedless grapes were being released. Um, and then we pick it up where we start getting more interest in um, the actual cultivars that were grown here. And as I said, there was not a lot of love for the way they were flavored. Um, in the 1850s, there were people that were actually starting to work on hybridizing. So um, as far as grapes go, a cross is when you mix two grapes that are the same species. A hybrid is when you mix two different species. Um, here in Native, Amer well, Native to American soil, you have um, Vitis rupestra, you have Vitis um, riparia, we have Vitis labrusca, and one that's very difficult for me to say, Vitis bulliceri, didn't say it right, but anyways, we call it Cenarian now. Um, and they all have their own characteristics, um, and they have their disease resistance, which is associated to this country here um, in the North America. So the interesting thing is, in the 1850s, people were looking to hybridize these grapes for various reasons. Um, sometimes it was just gentlemen farmers. They just kind of wanted to have some grapes that they could put in their gardens and show their friends. Um, and then again, other people were hoping to make more disease-resistant grapes um, and grapes that tasted different or produced more. Um, and of course, cold hardiness was always a trait that was desired. Um, so at that time, people that were in Europe were also very interested in checking out different cultivars. And there was always an exchange. Um, and some people believed that the advancement of steam locomotion helped spread disease a little bit quicker. Because there was a disease that's native to, the, that was native to um, North America only at the time. It was called Phylloxera. This is a terrible insect. Um, and it infects the roots. It overwinters there. Um, but it's kind of like an aphid. And it will suck the sap out. Um, but also it injects a chemical that kind of causes the root, to, the, excuse me, the trunk to rot and then the plant dies. Um, and it's really kind of awful because as the osmotic pressure lowers from the plant just sucking all the juice right out of it, then they just pull their proboscis out because at that point there's nothing to drink, they leave the plant and it dies. Uh, but they have a, like an 18 stage life cycle, you know, they fly, they live on the leaves. Um, wasn't a problem in Europe until, again, people started bringing cuttings of Native American grapes over to Europe and this caused the big phylloxera plague. Uh, about 1863, they started noticing that grapes were dying in the vineyards in France, in the Rhone region, and they had no idea what this was because they were just dying. Um, some of the grape growers noticed little, little mites, they called them grape lice. Um, there were different people, they weren't sure. Some people said, we think it's that stuff that's in, you know, in North America. And others said, no, it can't be the same thing. Um, it took, let's see, it took, an Amer it took a French botanist, a couple of French wine and grape growers, and a couple of Americans to determine that yes, it was indeed phylloxera that was here in the United States. Um, and it was a collaboration of these five or six individuals that actually um, brought about a way to deal with it because there is no cure for phylloxera. And what they came up with was, here in North America, we had these gentlemen in the 1860s and 70s that were making these hybrid, uh, hybrids of these American cultivars. And some of these cultivars actually had the traits that would allow them to grow in the high, uh, the soil has a lot of lime in these regions in France. And these cultivars could grow there. And so they were sent over and used as rootstocks. Um, of course, people really didn't like the idea of doing that, but with a rootstock you could still maintain the integrity. The cyan, or the top part, is your original plant that you wanted. It is your Vitis vinifera, uh, but you could have your whatever Vitis repestris or um, brusca or whatever hybrid on the bottom, and you could get that resistance to the phylloxera. So all told, that play cost the um, industry over there about, they say, sometimes it's written two-thirds of the industry was destroyed and sometimes nine-tenths. Um, I don't really know exactly what it was, but it was extremely significant. But this, um, this uh, you know, great breeding and how they were doing this with the cultivars and then using the rootstocks actually is what allowed for recovery at that time. And so how is this done? Um, kind of interesting. So in 1980, Bruce Rice, there were others before him, um, but he was doing the great breeding program and just recently retired. Um, there's many ways of doing it, so when you want to do a cross, um, a grape, well, a grape has either, they can be female grapes, and there can be also um, grape plants that are hermaphrodites. Um, many of the ones that we plant in our gardens and we use in the wineries are hermaphroditic, meaning that they can fertilize themselves. Um, so when you're trying to cross something that can fertilize itself, that's kind of tricky, right? Because you have to stop it from doing that. So if you may not recall from your plant biology, but if you can imagine the female part 
is the stigma, a little sticky top, the style that leads down to the ovary, which is generally going to be your fruit. Um, and then the male part is called an anther, and it's on a stamen. It has a little bit of pollen on it. So what you do is, if you want to cross one of these hermaphroditic grapes with some other grape, and you don't want the pollen to get on it, a few days before it's going to ripen and be ready, you simply remove those anthers. You remove the male part, so you emasculate the grape. Isn't that awful? Anyways, it works. So you take that poor emasculated grape, and then you take the pollen that you want, and you can take a paintbrush, and you can dust it onto the top of the stigma, and the stigma will have a little bead of water moisture on the top of it to let you know that it's ready. Um, so they do that, so that's all very painstakingly done, and they will cover it with a plastic bag. And the plastic bag is obviously so that there's no cross-pollination with anything else. Um, it allows it also to escape early predation from birds and insects. And then of course, as time goes by, you will get fruit. That fruit will be harvested, the seeds will be taken from that, those seeds will be then planted in the greenhouse, and those little seedlings will then be planted out in the nursery. And then the ones that survive, the ones that exhibit those traits that we're looking for, will actually then be planted in the vineyards. Um, this process sounds pretty fast when I'm talking about it, but on average between 20 and 30 years it takes for a grape to get released from this program. Um, so I do have a list here that I will pass around and anybody wants to take a look at it, it will show you some of the cultivars that have been, my assistant here, um, that have been released over the years from the Great Breeding Program. Now some other fun facts that have developed um, through the great research, um, great genetics, um, you know, there's definitely an interest in that. Um, how can we speed this process up? Well, hey, let's take some of the genes that we want. Let's say there's genes that have coded for resistance to um, powdery mildew, right? Pretty common disease. So what they want to do is you want to put a segment of those genes into your plant tissue so you can have a plant that now has resistance, genetic resistance. So how do we do this? Well, some really cool guys. Um, Sanford, let's see, John Sanford, um, Ed Wolf, and Nelson Allen, they started in 1880 to about 1983. They came up with a thing called the gene gun. Doesn't that sound like fun? And they called it biolistics. So basically what they do is, I think some were tungsten and I think it's gold now, um, tiny microparticles were actually coated with the DNA that you wanted to insert into the plant tissue. And um, using kind of a high pressure with helium, um, it's kind of shot into, just like it sounds like a gun, it's kind of shot right into the plant tissue. Um, some of the genes that you're shooting into the plant tissue um, are very selective genes for allowing the plants to grow on certain media, like let's say canamycin, which is sort of like an antibiotic. So what that means is, is you, you kind of fire the gun into it, you get all these genes into this tissue that you put on like a petri dish. The petri dish has that selective media, that canmycin in it, and the cells that grow on the canmycin are the ones that got the genes you wanted. Now those cells can be taken and grown into an actual plant, and now you have a plant that hopefully is exhibiting those genetic traits that you want, and that speeds the process up. And I have a picture of the gene gun, and my assistant can pass that around too. Here we go. So in 1986, they were selling this to people. Eventually, they sold the company to DuPont. Um, and this has been used to genetically modify soybeans. If any of you were to ask that question, I was asked that the other day. And yes, they were. So let me check my time. Getting just about there, folks. Um, so those are some interesting things that happened in the way of research. And again, my role as a winemaker um, was definitely to support the research. We support the research of the students coming in and of source research that was going on at the station, specifically great breeding. And we also supported research that's, um, you know, that was used for industry. I mean, if you're a winemaker, you really don't have the time to do a perfect study. You know, I said we kind of make the wine, it sounds really quick, but every step of the way, every part of that winemaking process, there's something documented. From the minute it comes in, we are weighing the grapes that are being, you know, put through the destemmer. We are weighing what comes out of the destemmer. We are weighing the juice fraction that's being pressed out. We are writing down what the nutrients are, um, you know, and then we are going up into the lab where I work now because I eventually left the wine lab and I run the wine analytical lab upstairs and we will check the major things that you would check when you're um, testing your wine. So the titratable acidity, it's good to know what the acid is in the wine, um, the pH, how much sugar is left when that wine is when it's done. Um, and we sometimes for, well, I'll get into what I do there a little, just a few more seconds. Um, but these parameters are important. Um, when you taste a wine, that acid in the wine is gonna 
really affect what you think and how you perceive the way that wine tastes. Um, if you've ever had a wine that's too tart, you say, oh, put a little you know, sugar in it. And that's just exactly what a winemaker might do if that balance is off. That's when we say the wine isn't balanced, right? If that acid is too much. Um, pH and acidity don't always line up, um, but they are related. Um, other things that we test for are volatile acidity. So during the winemaking process, there can be compounds that are made. Um, they're called volatile compounds, meaning that they don't really last long. They can sort of blow off or they're very easily boiled off. Um, and one major uh, volatile acidic compound that you would find in wine is acetic acid. And some of you may be saying, oh yeah, that's vinegar, right? And so a little tiny bit of acetic acid in the wine isn't going to make the wine taste horrible. But when you start getting over a certain level, then you're like, hmm, this smells like salad dressing. Maybe I don't really enjoy this, right? Um, not what I want to sip on in a Sunday afternoon. So um, all these things are important, and that brings me like what I'm doing now um, is I do work in the analytical lab, and we support industry in that people can actually send their samples in and have us test them. And if you are a small startup winery or brewery, um, it's much easier to have us test your samples for a small fee than it is to try to maintain and update and you know have a service contract on a big fancy piece of equipment. Um, a little bit of that sensory, which is always kind of fun to think about, you know, sensory is very subjective, and if you watch um, TV shows and you might see a movie, you know, some kind of rom-com where there's a snooty guy who's the sommelier, and it's like, oh, this came from the Alsace region in 1988. You know, you don't need to be that level to do wine sensory. And of course, if you're just doing wine for enjoyment, if it tastes good, it is good, right? Buy it. But if you're working in a sensory situation like we would do when we're trying to evaluate, say, some of Bruce Wine's, Bruce, excuse me, Bruce Wine, that's cool, Bruce Reich's cultivars, we're going to sit there and we're very critically going to rate it on a scale. Um, and we're going to rate characteristics. Does it have a muscat characteristic? When you think of muscat, you're thinking spicy, floral, maybe rose notes. That muscat is very distinctive, um, maybe a little bit of uh, tropical fruit. Um, and that's very desired, those aromatics as we call them in wines. Um, and then we also would evaluate, does it have a lot of Labrusca? And that Labrusca was that foxy thing I told you about, like cotton candy, and not everybody likes that. So for every cultivar that comes through that we've made wine for, we have done a sensory to decide whether that is going to stay. And usually three or four years, if it gets a bad rating, it gets pulled out of the vineyard, and it's no more. And that's the end of it. So really, that's the kind of the whole goal is, you know, we're doing things in viticulture to make that end product. Um, we're doing things in the enology to make that good end product. And we're doing that with sensory at the end. Let's see. Um, I mentioned I would talk a little bit about testing. So I've already talked about measuring for acidity. And we do sensory testing in the lab as well. And people say, you must have such a fun job. You get to taste wine all the time. Well. If you're making good wine, are you going to send it to me and ask me to taste it? No, <laughs> right? You're going to put it out in that tasting room. But if you're making wine that has some problems, that's when you're going to send it to me. Um, and we have ways of checking that. There's um, ways that our lab doesn't even actually have available um, ways of testing for certain compounds that are considered flaws. Um, but generally, the nose is a pretty good indicator. Um, if I smell a wine and it smells a little bit like rubber or eggs, then I know it's got some sulfur issues. Um, and that is something where I can recommend to that winemaker, you know, did you have good nitrogen in that when you started that ferment? Because yeast are just like people, they need good nutrition, right? And if they don't have good nutrition when they're fermenting your wine, sometimes they will make some stinky byproducts that you're not so happy with. Um, and that's how we help out the winemakers um, on a daily basis. Now, I have a, few, a little bit of some things I brought in that I thought might be fun to look at. Um, in the old days, if you wanted to measure the bricks or the sugar content of your grapes coming in, you would put them in this refractometer, and there was a little scale in it. And if you hold it up to the light, I don't know if we got enough light in here, but you might be able to see it. You can actually see um, there's a line, and that would tell you what percent um, sugar's in there. I'm going to put a drop of juice in this and pass it around, and you all can have fun. Don't worry if it flops open, just close it. Pass it around and look through it anyways. 
Another thing we test, um, the great thing about wine is that, and of course historically, any fermented beverage was made, one of the first reasons that fermented beverages were made is because it was a way to make something you drink safe. You know, Think of when you had contaminated polluted water supplies. So when you start getting upwards of 5% alcohol, that is going to prevent any human pathogens from living in that product. Um, and that's the beauty of cider and stuff. So you could take something that's rotting, you know, it's not so good, um, like cider. Of course, grape, you don't want so much rot in it, depending on the style you're going for. But anyways, you do have active yeast cultures that are doing the fermentation. However, at the end of that process, if you're gonna put something in a bottle, and something that uses sugar and makes gas as a byproduct, you probably don't want to have it doing a lot in your bottle, right, if you put a cork in it. So if you're a winemaker and you have a sugary wine, maybe more than 2% sugar, you probably don't want any yeast in there that are alive because otherwise you're going to have exploding bottles, you're going to have yeast settling out. It's not going to be pretty. So we will do what we call a sterility test. Um, pass around one of our funnels. There would be a sterile filter in that. We would sterile 100 mils through this and it would be grown on our nutritive media, and you would hope that nothing grows. So I'm gonna send two plates around with this. One plate is what the winemaker wants to see, nothing. The other plate is filled with yeast. So, fun things, demonstration. I'm so glad I brought my husband, he's such a good assistant. And last but not least, I'm not gonna pass this around, but I thought it was just kinda of cool. This is an abuleometer, and this is how some people still do measure alcohol using this, and it is a skill, um, and you know, we say to folks that um, they're not as reliable for measuring um, the alcohol in wines that have very high sugar, but people that have been using these for years usually do a very, very good job. But there is a lot of room for operator error. So until someone is very experienced with it, it's not the best way to test your alcohol. Um, and of course, with regulatory um, bodies like the TTB, um, they definitely want to have a third-party lab testing alcohol. Now, if you're a winemaker, you have a tolerance of 1.5% on either side of the alcohol that you put on your label. So you do have a little room for that. And it's probably because winemaking has evolved with different ways of testing for um, percent alcohol. But anyways, it's pretty cool. The wine goes in here. There's a little lamp. It's boiled. Um, you take a measurement when it gets to a certain point with the thermometer, and then there's a scale that you use. So I just wanted to show you some of the older things that were used back in the day. Um, today, again, we have different types of equipment, distillation units, um, densitometers, and fun things in the lab. But I think this is about where I need to end for our next speaker. And shall I introduce her? Do you want to introduce yourself? Why don't you introduce her, Don? And if there's any questions afterwards, you're welcome to ask me. As you see, I had like five piles of notes, but it didn't take me long to talk for like <laughs> this long, so here we go.